In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So for Lent this year, we will be focusing our preaching on the Ten Commandments. Now before you stop watching, I promise it will be interesting, or at least not as sinfully boring as you might initially think. I know, I've already downgraded from interesting to not boring, but stay with me. So before we get to the Ten Commandments, I thought you should know that there are several imitations of them. I did a little research so I could share my favorite of these with you. So here's the first one. There's the Ten Commandments of Success. The Ten Commandments of Success. Commandment number six being, Thou must realize that plans are only dreams without action. Of course, I don't know if the reverse of this commandment is true. Actions are only dreams without plans. It sounds off to me. Then there is the Ten Commandments of a Successful Marriage. Now, commandment number nine uh, was a bit of a doozy, in my humble opinion, and it's quite long and it goes like this. Thou shalt recognize the purpose of our relationship is to help heal each other's childhood wounds and recognize that our partner's needs are a blueprint for our own personal growth. See, now, now you know what the purpose of marriage is all about. It's the first time I heard that. I even found the Ten Commandments of Computer Ethics. These stay a little bit closer to the original Biblical Ten Commandments, with commandment number five, if they had read the Bible more closely, it really would have been commandment number nine, being, thou shalt not use a computer to bear false witness. I will now, uh, I want to give us now a few minutes to all delete our Facebook accounts. There are even the Ten Commandments of Preaching. I reviewed these very carefully, as you could imagine. But I need to be honest, I truly, and this is serious, I've truly broken so many of them that I'm not even going to give you an example from that list. It would be too embarrassing on my, on my part. So obviously, the idea of Ten Commandments has some cultural value. But I think if we're going to be honest, most of us, myself included, probably cannot list them all to say nothing of listing them in their proper order. Because they show up in two separate places in the Bible, in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, I guess we weren't the only ones who had trouble remembering them. Now at the beginning of the sermon, I promised that today's preaching on the Ten Commandments would not be, and I quote myself, sinfully boring. So you can feel free to use the comments section in Facebook Live if you feel I've already failed, but remember it's Lent and I'll see the comments as I'm preaching. But if you're still with me, if you're still with me, I want to briefly focus on two of them. The first commandment, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. And the second commandment, which plays off the first, and it's this, you shall not make for yourself any idol. The first commandment really names a reality that is all too common though we might not realize it at first. And it is simply this. We become what we worship. And because human beings are creatures who worship, we are in a bit of a pickle. Because it's not really a question of whether we will worship something, but rather, what do we find ourselves already worshiping? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. I will now name some of the other small g gods that I have worshipped. Money. Health. Success. Praise. Attention. You all will have your own list, and it's worth taking note of this Lent. It's not really a question of whether we will worship something, but rather, what do we find ourselves already worshiping? 
Again, the second commandment, which plays off the first, is this. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Those of you who might know me a little bit know that I am obsessed with the category of idolatry, which I know is kind of ironic and frankly probably idolatrous. But here's what I mean. It's one thing to know you are supposed to worship the true God. And it's another to figure out if the ways you are doing this are actually bringing you closer or further away from the true God. The more we reduce God to simply an item in the world, God as created rather than the creator, well, we'll be on the way to embracing an idolatrous lifestyle. An idol is simply something, often even a good thing, that we try to make bear the weight of being God. Most of the time, we know it isn't God. But we would rather an idol we can control than a God who surprises. God wants us to know who he or she is first. So we have a better chance of not creating him or her in our own image. We become what we worship. Which is why God took such care to reveal God's self. First to the people of Israel and second to those who are their spiritual ancestors, us. What is Jesus but the image and not the idol of God? An idol keeps its attention on itself. An image, an icon really, points you to a deeper reality. The way that Jesus constantly pointed to God the Father and the Holy Spirit points to Jesus the Son. Now John Calvin, the Protestant reformer, who definitely said some batshit crazy stuff, excuse my French, but who hasn't really, right? He did also say a lot of true things as well. One of which was this. The human heart is a perpetual idol factory. The human heart is a perpetual idol factory. Which is why in Lent, in particular, we ask God to make in us new and contrite hearts. We become what we worship. And the first and second commandments remind us of this truth. So here is my advice to you, probably more even to me. Take care this Lent to worship what you want to become. Amen.